Jeff, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very for having me. To have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, let me start off by um, by saying that we usually ease into those conversations with um, with lighter topics. However, uh, there's a very special topic on everyone's mind this week, and that is recent immigration policies. Mm -hmm. So we are 40% international, and um, it's affected us quite deeply. So as a CEO representing your company to the public, how did you think about reacting to last weekend's executive order? Yeah, it's, uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So there's uh, different ways to go about addressing an issue like that. And you have to think about your audience, your constituencies, and who you're trying to reach, and what your objectives are. The first thing to keep in mind in a situation like that, at least uh, for us at LinkedIn, is the well-being and the safety of our employees. Uh, we, like the student body here, have a number of uh, immigrants at the company. Uh, we have a number of people who have yet to become citizens who are here on working visas and green cards. And we wanted to make sure that we could identify anyone who was a citizen from one of the named seven countries and that they were here and present and accounted for and safe. And we wanted to uh, also do that for their immediate family. So that was the very first consideration. Mm -hmm. The next thing we wanted to do was make sure that we were making clear how people could get involved if they wanted to help and make a difference. Uh, as a company, you know, our vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, all of them. Uh, that is irrespective of country of origin, ethnicity, religious belief. And uh, we have had some ongoing programs to help refugees find work. Uh, that started in Sweden, and we had some, some success there, some early success. We extended that program to Canada, and with the executive order that was announced here last Friday, uh, we accelerated the launch of what we call the Welcome Talent Program here in the United States. We also wanted to make sure that employees who wanted to get involved understood that through our employee-based foundation, uh, they could contribute and we could allocate those funds uh, to efforts that are making a difference. Mm -hmm. Then there was the, the third kind of dimension of this, which is making clear, at least from my perspective, uh, where I stood on this. And it's important, I don't feel the need to comment on everything, to be able to comment on anything. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, there are going to be issues that I feel are important for me to address. And they're important to our employees. And uh, this was one of those times. Mm -hmm. And in a situation like this, uh, at least through my experience, one of the things that I've learned is that you have to strike uh, a very delicate balance when you're expressing personal belief versus expressing belief as a CEO, because you're representing your employees, your company. And in this particular instance, I felt the need to express my own views on this. And that was that this country, the United States, was founded on a first principle and belief that all people should have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And America, <laughs> that America has truly been a land of opportunity. It is a country and an economy that was largely built on the tireless efforts of immigrants who came to this country seeking a better life for themselves and their families, that ultimately uh, created a spirit of entrepreneurship and were able to innovate and introduce products and services and build companies that employed many, many people and made a difference in the lives of so many in this country and beyond. And I shared through social media the, a statistic that some people may be less familiar with, but that 40% uh, of the Fortune 500 was founded by immigrants or the children of immigrants. Yep. Just as one uh, empirical point uh, to support this idea. And then again, coming back to our vision as a company where this uh, becomes aligned, mm -hmm is our position, our purpose, to create economic opportunity uh, for every member of the global workforce. And so uh, 
you know, I was expressing that position. And at the same time, and you asked the question, how as a CEO do I address this? It's very important for any of you that go on to start your own companies, join companies, become senior leadership, or become a CEO yourself, that you recognize that not every employee within your organization may agree with you or may agree with the people they work next to day in and day out. And this was a very valuable lesson that many of us learned during this election cycle. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of folks uh, in California vote a certain way, in Silicon Valley vote a certain way, within a specific company may vote a certain way. And so as I was expressing these thoughts, I wanted to make sure that our team understood that mine was one opinion, that other people within the organization may disagree, and that we should be respectful of those disagreements. We want to create an environment where people feel like they belong, as long as that's consistent with our culture and values. And again, that is an organization and an environment where all people, irrespective of their country of origin, their political leanings or affiliations, uh, you know, their creeds, their orientation, uh, it is independent of all of those things, that we're going to treat one another with compassion, and we're going to take care of one another, we're going to be respectful of one another. Thank you very much for that. We've been having a very rich debate over the past few days internally between both classes and drawing the line between our personal reactions to what as an institution we need to represent has been a tricky, I would say at least, discussion. So uh, thank you very much for this perspective, it's great. And before we go into the specifics of LinkedIn, um, I wanted to get your take on another topic that, well, that could potentially have very high impact on the workforce. So um, a couple of months ago, you addressed uh, your, the LinkedIn employees, and you told them about what some people refer to uh, as the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit more about that concept and how you think it's actually going to shift the dynamics of the workforce and the economy as a yeah. whole? Absolutely. So uh, this was uh, a theory that uh, I first became familiar with through the World Economic Forum. And they were talking about the fourth industrial revolution, uh, the first mechanization largely based on the steam engine. And uh, the second was mass production, and that was largely based on the introduction of electricity, division of labor, uh, assembly lines, and factories. Uh, the third was automation, and that uh, followed uh, electronics, early stage computing, and IT. And this fourth industrial revolution, uh, based on robotization, and uh, the technologies and the innovations underpinning this fourth uh, industrial revolution include robots, uh, AI, sensors, autonomous driving, et cetera. And what's noteworthy about this fourth industrial revolution is that in the first three cases, uh, new innovations, new technologies gave rise to companies that generated massive gains in productivity and new job opportunities. And there is increasingly a belief that in this latest fourth industrial revolution, that may not be the case. That the new technologies may actually displace more workers and jobs than they create. And certainly that was the case in this body of research from the World Economic Forum, where they predicted while 7 million gross jobs would be eliminated between now and 2020, uh, 2 million would be added through the advent of new technology, so we would lose five million jobs, and there are some that believe that is a highly conservative estimate, that far more people than that will be displaced as a result of new technologies and innovation. And you can see this now and start to feel it, and, and sure enough, uh, at this year's Davos event uh, that's hosted by the World Economic Forum, there was a general consensus that one of the key uh, points to come out of this, one of the key learnings was this whole meme, this whole idea has been discussed now for years. It's been predicted for years. And if you talked to attendees this year, they felt like something had tipped. Mm -hmm. And whether it was heads of state or CEOs, founders, uh, there was a general consensus that it was no longer a prognostication. It was actually happening. And all of you have probably seen this anecdotally, week in and week out, if you're following business news. It seems like literally every other week, there's another story about a major factory that has decided to deploy robot technology that will displace tens of thousands of people, or a major retailer and major warehousing infrastructure that has grown the number of robots being deployed by tens of thousands, or autonomous driving, which has the potential to happen far faster than anyone could have anticipated. 
And for those that don't know, trucking is like the number one profession in California. A lot of people don't realize that. And what happens to those folks? I think it's absolutely essential that any time there are stories about these new technologies, it's wonderful to be excited about innovation and things that could potentially unlock tons of value on a global basis for people. But I think it's also equally important, if not more important, every time we see these articles, to understand what's happening to the people who are being impacted and potentially displaced. Mm -hmm. What programs are we putting into place to reskill these employees? Are they being certified in new skills for the jobs that are and will be as opposed to the jobs that once were? Where is the spirit of entrepreneurship and the investment and the energy in vocational training and innovation in how we train people to take on these new technologies and the job opportunities created by these new technologies? How are we leveraging infrastructure that we couldn't have even dreamed of decades ago? Take LinkedIn as an example. You look at the data we have. We're developing the world's first economic graph and our understanding, take any locality in the world and we're in a position now where we can understand the fastest growing jobs within that locality, the skills required to obtain those jobs. We can understand the skills of the aggregate workforce within that locality. We can measure the gap and then we can provide this data to junior colleges, vocational training facilities, even four-year universities, and help them to create just-in-time curriculum. This is the kind of thing I think increasingly as a society we need to be spending more time on understanding and solving for. All right. So actually, you've, you've touched upon what I was about to ask you next, which is educational reform is something that you're very passionate about. Mm -hmm. So let me rephrase the question and to ask, are there any systems out there that you think will provide the better match to, uh, to the shifting economy and the needs of the workforce moving forward? Well, coming back to education reform, because it goes you know, well beyond uh, how we're going to reskill displaced workers, I think from a generational perspective, it starts with primary education mm -hmm. and then K through 12. And we need to make sure that increasingly we are providing schools and teachers uh, the assets, the curriculum, the technology they need uh, to bring our students into the 21st century successfully. Rote learning and the same things that uh, were deployed to help people train for the industrial revolutions that came prior that we talked yeah. about. For those that don't know, uh, well, we'll do a little bit of a pop quiz. How many in the audience know why there is summer vacation in American schools? So the kids could go harvest the fields. When was the last time any of you went out harvesting the fields? <laughs> OK. Uh, do you know why, in part, we sit in rows and why rote learning was such an important part of primary school? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Assembly lines. So we exist in a different world. And increasingly, the world has become more digital, more networked. Things change much faster than they've ever changed. That's not anecdotal. It's empirical. And so we need to teach critical reasoning. We need to teach creative problem solving. We need to teach collaboration. We need to teach compassion. We need to change the way in which we're training the future workforce. I think there are now technologies that we can take advantage of that will help teachers and help administrators focus more and more of their time on teaching these skills. And we can leverage adaptive learning platforms to teach more of the commodity-based skills, the basics. And we're still in very early innings in terms of being able to fully deploy and take advantage of these new technologies. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the importance of vocational change, so moving beyond the genera generational change. That's going to take years, and, but we've got to start investing in that right now. But what about the workers being displaced today? <clears throat> we need to go all in on vocational training. And historically, and speaking uh, in the US now, uh, from a societal perspective, I think we've placed tremendous emphasis and weighting on degrees from prestigious four-year universities or graduate schools. And that matters, and it's important. But it's also important for people who are going down a different path 
to have access to an education where they can develop a skill and a trade that they can utilize to earn a living and create a career path. And you see this in countries like Germany that have done this extraordinarily well. And so this isn't just a technical issue. Uh, it's also a societal and a cultural issue. Thank you very much for that. Now we want to get to know you a little bit better. So we're going to take you a little bit back to the start of your time at LinkedIn. I thought we were about to do this as your life. And like, <laughs> I'm going to start <laughs> flashing like pictures from my childhood. That's what I would have done if immigration wasn't an issue. <laughs> okay. But essentially, um, back when you look at when you first joined LinkedIn, yep. um, transitions are very difficult especially when it's a very fast-growing environment. Yeah. So what were the key success factors that kind of made the handover between Reid Hoffman and yourself smooth? Reid Hoffman, Stanford alum, Reid Hoffman. Yep. Teaches symbolic you. systems. <laughs> Anyone? Symbolic systems study underground? Had him in a class last year, I guess. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Good man. Uh, very, very uh, bright, extraordinarily thoughtful. And that's actually a part of why our handoff was so successful. So. Uh, I, I first met uh, Reed, as the dean said, uh, at a dinner. Uh, we were at a restaurant in San Francisco, uh, and we were doing some brainstorming for an event aptly titled Brainstorm, and they wanted to talk to about 20 or 30 folks from the Valley about their ideas for event material and the agenda. And I remember Reed answering a question that had been posed, and I was really struck by not only his intelligence, but how he was coming at it from a different perspective. And, uh, we had been told by different people uh, who knew us that we should meet at some point, so we had a chance to meet on that occasion. And a uh, little piece of trivia, Reed was actually the last guest speaker I brought in uh, to talk to my team when I was an executive at Yahoo uh, before I ended up leaving the company. At any rate, when LinkedIn elected to make uh, a change at the CEO level, uh, for those that don't know, uh, Reed had been the founder and CEO. He had then hired a professional CEO, a guy named Dan Nye, who did a wonderful job. And Reed was the president of product, reporting to Dan, who was the CEO, who then reported to Reed as the chairman and founder of the company. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with that construct? <laughs> so uh, it didn't work out the way people had hoped. Uh, and the two of them had a great deal of admiration for one another. That's not what it was about. So when Reed was looking to make a change and he asked me to get involved, uh, he said, he, I was a, at the time I was an executive in residence at Greylock and uh, LinkedIn was a portfolio company and I understood they were making a change and someone said, would I be interested in helping out? And I said, absolutely, that's one of the reasons I'm here. So I'll, you know, I'll take a couple of days a week and I'll help Reed out any way I can. And they said, okay, you should go meet with him. I said, okay. So I go and meet with Reed. We were actually in his house, and I think uh, I was sitting in a LinkedIn beanbag chair with like the words innovation, and everything had an in logo on it. And he said, so I have uh, two lists. I have uh, an interim CEO list and a full-time CEO list, and you're the only person on both lists, so what do you say? It's like, whoa, what, what, you know, I, I was gonna volunteer to help. He's like, no, no, you gotta, you gotta come in and let's make this happen. So I agreed that uh, well, I was going to start on an interim basis uh, because I had just left Yahoo. Um, I was there for a number of years and uh, wasn't sure how quickly I wanted to get back into a full-time position. And I said, as long as he was open to having me full-time and I could start interim, I'd be open to that. And he said, as long as you're open to being full-time, you start as interim and then we'll see how it goes. I said, great. The night before I joined, I called him. I was going to start as interim president with all the responsibilities of a CEO, but interim president. And I called him and I said, so, you're still gonna be the CEO, at least in title symbolically. I'm coming as interim president. Which decisions would you like to make? And which decisions do you think I should be responsible for? I wanna make sure we had clarity before I started. He said, this is easy. It's your ball, you run with it. I go, what? He said, yeah, you're gonna make all the decisions. <laughs> That's why I'm bringing you in like this. And I just learned what not to do. Now, to give you an indication of truly how thoughtful he is, he went a step further. And over the course of the first 10 weeks I was at LinkedIn, Reed was out of the office. He scheduled trips and travel for roughly six to eight weeks of that time. Because he recognized, no matter what we explained to people, that muscle memory was still gonna be in place and people were still gonna go to him. So he literally physically took himself out of the situation so I could build 
that connective tissue with the organization. So between that and between uh, the graciousness of my predecessor, Dan Nine, the way he handed off the baton, you know, in a situation like that, uh, the person who's leaving the company can sometimes be angry and bitter, and uh, they can poison the well to some extent. And Dan was, did the exact opposite. He operated with absolute integrity throughout the entire process. The last thing I would say is one of the most frequently asked questions I got when I first joined LinkedIn was, what's it like working with Reed? And that was code for, what's all the drama happening between you and the founder of the company? And what people didn't realize was, I joined LinkedIn not in spite of Reed, but in large part because of Reed. I had a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for him. I wanted to work with him. And he's gone on to become one of my closest friends, someone I would certainly go to for advice. And uh, we've had a, a wonderful partnership ever since. Well, you've built a great thing. Thank you. And you, um, you stress on purpose-driven culture. Mm. So what is the purpose of LinkedIn? And how did that translate to, to the culture that, that you guys built over yeah. there? So I mentioned earlier uh, our vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. We separate vision and mission at LinkedIn. Uh, some companies use these synonymously, and I think that's a lost opportunity. Vision for us is the dream. It's true north. It, what's, it's, it gets us out of bed every morning coming into work. Uh, mission is an overarching objective for the organization that is realizable, measurable, and hopefully inspirational. Mm -hmm. So they play two different roles. Our mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. We believe, believe deeply in our mission. We believe deeply in our vision. And our sense of purpose is one of the things that defines us as an organization. It's not just the what, however. It's also the how, our culture and values. It's not just about what we're trying to accomplish and the results that we generate. It's how we go about doing that. And increasingly, I think both purpose and uh, the idea of culture and values is what attracts people to join organizations. That's certainly the case uh, with the younger generation, with the millennial generation, where you find time and time again, uh, people seem to be more driven by purpose then they do some of the things that uh, mattered perhaps more historically. Uh, you know, compensation, title, these things are still important, but I think talking to more and more younger people, purpose and what the company is ultimately trying to accomplish and the impact it's gonna have in the world uh, seems to be more heavily weighted. And it's not just among employees. It's also increasingly customers who by virtue of social media have a transparent view into how companies operate. And increasingly, they're interested in making purchasing decisions, not just by virtue of the quality of a product, but what the company's all about, what the comp company's trying to accomplish, and how they're trying to accomplish it. And regardless of whether or not the company is making clear how they're going about their business, people are going to find out in this day and age. Mm -hmm. So I think purpose uh, plays an important role in terms of inspiration, motivation, not only of your employees, uh, but also in terms of building a relationship uh, with your end customers and all the key constituents within your ecosystem. So that purpose, when you, when you, if I walk into an, an average office floor in a LinkedIn building and I walk in, what are the culture components? What am I going to feel out of the group that represents the purpose that you just talked about of creating economic opportunity? Yeah. So you're going to get a sense. I mean, if you literally ask people, they would tell you. We, we have five cultural dimensions. We have six values. And uh, in summary, if you ask people to define our culture, they would say it's a culture of transformation, transformation of the self, transformation of the company, transformation of the world. Uh, the other four, integrity, collaboration, humor, and results. Okay. Uh, with regard to our values, the first value that they'll tell you about and our most important value is that our members come first. Not at the exclusion of everything else we do. It's not members only, but it's members first when we're making decisions uh, because without our members, we don't exist. Uh, relationships matter, uh, and nested underneath that is to manage compassionately, uh, to be open, honest, and constructive, to demand excellence, to take intelligent risks, and to act like an owner. And I would have a fairly high degree of confidence that if you picked random people out, they'd be able to summarize that for you fairly accurately. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason for that is because as an organization, we've made a commitment to not just talk the talk and put it up on the walls and distribute the laminated cards that people put in their wallets, but to walk the walk. And we do it through our recruiting process and ensuring that people are not just experienced and don't just have the right skills, but are also going to be a fit for our organization. We reinforce it on their first day through the onboarding process. We develop against it through learning and development and how we continue to educate and groom people throughout the organization. And we evaluate performance against it. And this comes back to what we were talking about with regard to purpose, that it's not just about the results you get within our organization. It's also about how you went about doing it. Mm -hmm. And you see this, it seems to some extent stra straightforward when you're physically in the same space and mm -hmm. you can kind of have your finger on the pulse of what's happening. Mm -hmm. But what about when you're bringing in thousands of people across the globe? How do you track it? How do you make sure it's still there? It's an excellent question. And the reason I'm smiling is I think this is where a lot of hyper-growth organizations have a tendency to potentially go off the rails. The reason being, when you're in hyper-growth mode, there is so much demand for your products or services, you're trying to keep up with that demand to the best of your ability. And more often than not, you have to hire a lot of people to do so whether it's people who are producing the product, engineers, product people, designers, web devs, et cetera, or the people selling the product, or the people who are supporting the teams that are doing so and uh, taking it to market, et cetera. And so there's a natural inclination, even if you've really spent the time and energy mm -hmm. to define your mission, codify your mission, codify your vision, codify your culture and your values. What you'll see from time to time is people compromising on those things to keep up. And I'll give you an example of this, uh, an actual thing that happened. So uh, early on in our hyper growth mode, I remember sitting around a table with uh, a number of senior executives and we were evaluating a candidate uh, who was going to fill a, a very pressing need for us. And as we were reviewing their LinkedIn profile, you didn't think I was gonna say resume, right? <laughs> as we were reviewing their LinkedIn profile, uh, the person who was sponsoring this uh, particular prospect said, uh, look at this background. Look at the experience, the skill set, the things they were involved with, the companies they worked for. I would add they're not a cultural fit per se. I have some concerns, but we'll take care of that. We'll coach them. That we'll put this person with the right mentor. We'll make it happen. You know how often that works out? <laughs> so uh, it's very rare. Very rare. There are exceptions, but it, it's seldom it, does someone change their stripes in a situation like that. And what happens is, exactly to the point of your question, when you're all, you start up a company and you're basically all under the same roof, you may all be in the same room. And as you grow, maybe you're occupying different floors within the same building. It's still pretty easy to communicate, it's pretty easy to take the pulse of the organization. You're going to hear about things that aren't working out. You can get involved and fix them. As soon as you start to really grow and expand to multiple offices, multiple cities, multiple countries, imagine bringing that person into your organization and having them lead a particular operation where you're not physically proximate. And they're bringing their own baggage. They're bringing what they believe is the right thing to do. And you're not around to help course correct. So they're now hiring people against what they believe is the right thing to do. And you're growing so fast, this dynamic is taking place across multiple functional areas and multiple cities. And before you know it, you're going to have a very, very significant problem. So what you want to have happen is what happened, fast forward about six to nine months, sitting around a similar table, similar group of people, evaluating a similarly important candidate. Person says, look at this experience, look at these skills, not a cultural fit. Let's move on to the next candidate. And I was like, all right. <laughs> and where you're really on to something is when that conversation starts taking place without you being in the room. And that's when you're on a path to successfully scaling the talent within your organization and your culture. You, you talk a lot about managing compassion that you just mm -hmm. referenced in your answer. So what does that mean? And how does it translate in your daily routine? I just fail to, to see how that looks on a daily basis. Yeah. Uh, so managing compassionately is about putting yourself in another person's shoes and seeing the world through their lens or perspective. Classically defined, that's for the purpose of alleviating their suffering, 
uh, within a business context, I believe it doesn't have to be limited to alleviating suffering. It can be helping them, helping the team, helping the organization. And, you know, day in and day out, whenever any of us are dealing with other people, there are going to be times where you're disagreeing. There's going to be conflict. As a matter of fact, you probably had some conflicts today that you could think of. And if you were to go to any company, anywhere in the valley or anywhere in the world for that matter, and you said, how many of you have had some degree of conflict throughout this working day, uh, you'd have a fair number of hands go up. And what typically happens when people experience this conflict is one party, one person, is going to start to escalate emotionally. They're going to get angry. They're going to get defensive. They're going to go on the attack. And more often than not, uh, the person on the receiving end of that may have uh, an empathetic response, which is to feel the anger that the other person's feeling and become angry themselves. It's important, by the way, to distinguish between empathy and compassion. It's really important if you aspire to managing compassionately. A lot of people, particularly in Western society, including myself you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, would use empathy and compassion synonymously. Empathy is feeling what another person is feeling fundamental building block to compassion. Compassion is maintaining enough distance where you can actually do something about the way the other person feels. If you are strictly having an empathetic response, uh, to put it in the parlance of the Dalai Lama, if you were walking along a trail in the mountains and you came across a person who was being crushed by a boulder on their chest and they were suffocating, the empathetic response would be for you to suffocate as well. And if you're suffocating, you're no longer in a position where you can help them. The compassionate response is to reflect on the fact that not for too long if they're suffocating, but to understand that this person is suffering and to do whatever you can to alleviate that suffering, get the boulder off their chest. So what does that mean? How do you, what does that translate to in a work environment? So you're sitting there, you're in a meeting, and there's a disagreement. They get angry. You would normally get angry. You would normally get defensive if they're getting defensive. And this goes back and forth. And it becomes very challenging to resolve. But what if, rather than just blindly mirror their emotion, or in other cases, oftentimes, people just assume nefarious intention? Well, how, how dare this person disagree with me or attack my belief, my recommendation? Uh, they must be political, territorial. Uh, they must be ignorant, as opposed to the compassionate response. Being a spectator to your own thoughts, and especially your emotions, so taking a step outside of yourself and understanding what's going on. Maybe that person is having a bad day, and it's got nothing to do with you or anything you said. Maybe you pushed a button in that person where they had something traumatic happen to them five years prior, uh, unbeknownst to you. Maybe you're talking about a subject that the person is less familiar with, and they're feeling a little bit vulnerable, a little bit insecure about looking bad in front of their peers. I could go on and on with all the potential reasons that this person may be acting the way that they are. And the more you can take the time to understand that, the more you can connect with the person and constructively begin to understand where they're coming from and work towards compromise, or at the very least, work towards shared understanding. That's managing compassionately. And more often than not, especially younger, less experienced executives like myself was you know, 10, 12 years ago, we have a tendency to expect everyone around us to do things the way we do them. That is natural. It's egocentric, not egomaniacal. Okay? It's egocentric, and that's human nature. But you're not going to get the best out of the people you're working with if you're constantly holding them up against a lens or a bar of what you yourself are capable of and precisely how you do things. What makes far more sense, where you're going to get much more value out of those individuals in the team, is when you understand their strengths, their unique strengths. You play to their strengths. Where you understand areas for improvement and you coach them on those areas for improvement. Or you change their role such that it's better aligned with their strengths. And when you can do that, when you can begin to do that, you start to unlock value that's not possible when you're only thinking about the world through your own lens. And so managing compassionately has been something I've been aspiring to do now 
since first realizing this, and like I said, it's probably coming up on 12 plus years at this point. I say aspiring because it's really, really hard to do because we're all human and we all have buttons that get pushed. So for anyone out there that decides they do want to practice more compassion at work, recognize you're not always going to be able to do it and that's okay. The aspirational component of that's really important. I'm sure most of us after this talk are going to empathize with you and try to feel what it's like to build a $26 billion company. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's promising. You're, um, you're one of the very few CEOs that survived multiple uh, growth transitions. Mm. So you went from private to public and then through the Microsoft acquisition. What keeps you the right man for the job? And what were the different challenges that you had with each stage? So in terms of the challenges at each stage, it's funny uh, you frame the question that way. Uh, I used to get asked after I uh, first joined the company about six, nine months of being there, what keeps me up at night? Mm -hmm. And uh, beyond having a newborn at the time, uh, which was keeping us up, uh, literally keeping us up at night, <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the, the work, it wasn't keeping me up at night per se, but what I constantly and, and vigilantly focused on uh, was the idea of focus and scale. That was the case when I first joined the organization. We had 338 people. That's the case today. We have north of 10,000 people. Focus and scale. Focus is understanding not just your mission and your vision and your culture and your values, but your core value proposition. What is the value that you're going to bring to the people that you serve, your members, your customers, et cetera? And all too often, particularly uh, amongst hyper-growth companies, you see organizations that break through on something. They introduce a new product or service. And there's massive, massive demand. And they go on this hyper-growth journey. But they don't necessarily take the time to codify and really specify their core value proposition. You know, if you wanted to visualize, think about a target. And the bullseye is your your core value proposition or the manifestation, the product or service that's going to be the clearest manifestation of your core value proposition. Our core value proposition is to connect our members and customers to opportunity. And when you draw this target, you start with that bullseye, and then you can add concentric circles. And those concentric circles are what's possible, the adjacencies that are possible as you extend from your core. If companies do take the time to define the core, and that's one of the, the classic mistakes is they don't take the time to do so. But if they do take the time to define the core, the next most common mistake I see in a hypergrowth situation is to draw resources away from the core too quickly in pursuit of the next bright, shiny object. And as a result of that, you leave your core vulnerable. And if you've had success, there's going to be a lot of competition waiting for you to stumble. And they've seen what you've done. And they're going after your core. And then they go after the core, and you're in a position where you have to react to the competition now, and you have to draw resources away from that growth opportunity back to your core, and you're whipsawing people within your organization. Now you're reacting as opposed to being proactive and strategic, and that is no good. So clearly define and codify your core. Make sure your first managerial cycle, your first dollar of capital, your first resources are going into the support of building that core and achieving critical mass. And once you achieve critical mass, then take incremental investment and invest it into strategic opportunities and what we like to call venture plays or venture bets. So that focus is critical. Uh, it's also really important that people take the time to understand scale. And again, with regard to hypergrowth companies, a lot of organizations and the people leading these organizations become fixated on innovation. And at times, that happens at the exclusion of putting the right building blocks in place to support scale over time. And scale, brass tacks, comes from less glamorous things. It comes from investing in the right people and talent. It comes from investing in the right process. It comes from investing in the right infrastructure. And that will lead to future innovation and success. But if you're focused on innovation at the exclusion of those things, or you're not taking the time and energy and prioritizing those elements, those foundational building blocks, it's going to be very, very difficult to scale the organization over time. 
The last thing I would add, if, if we're talking about a company in terms of multiple phases, is as an organization matures and it comes out of hypergrowth, which inevitably happens to virtually all organizations, although if you look at Facebook's most recent results, they're still growing 50%, $32 billion revenue run rate, which kind of defies gravity, very unusual. But as organizations mature and their growth rates slow, it's really important to get ahead of that dynamic. And that starts by being very honest with yourself about your addressable opportunity. And I think all too often, companies kind of get a little too uh, fixated on the marketing material and how they position the organization, what the company's capable of doing, and they're not necessarily honest with themselves about the real addressable. And if organizations just use these theoretical numbers and constructs, and they don't really look under the hood in terms of where saturation is going to occur, you're going to end up reacting to slowing growth as opposed to proactively addressing it and ideally laying uh, the, the groundwork and layering an investment that enables you to add the next S-curve before that growth decline begins. And that is absolutely critical towards sustainable growth. And you see it amongst you know, the, the modern tech titans increasingly, these organizations making huge investments beyond the core, and they're being very proactive and very strategic about it. And that continues to help them sustain growth at unbelievable levels of scale. That sounds like a course that we should have you at the GSB. So yeah, just put well, it out read, there. Well, <laughs> read, in all seriousness, uh, Reed and uh, a few f uh, friends of his uh, taught a course here on blitz scaling, mm -hmm. uh, where they talked about how to scale in order, and the dean's going, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> um, the LinkedIn team just, uh, or the LinkedIn team built what, um, a $26.2 billion company, the largest acquisition that Microsoft has ever made. It's quite an accomplishment. So congratulations. Thank you. How do you envision the future with this partnership? What is it going to change? So uh, in terms of change, it, I'll tell you what it doesn't change. It doesn't change our sense of purpose. It doesn't change our vision or our mission. And that was uh, critical to getting the deal done. So when Satya and I first sat down uh, before the deal was announced, we both agreed that we would have to have at least two dimensions uh, in place in terms of strong alignment. One was sense of purpose, uh, and the other was structure. Uh, and with regard to sense of purpose, it turns out that our mission, though worded differently than Microsoft's mission to empower every individual and organization on the planet to achieve more, are actually quite similar. Different wording. And we have gone about it differently. We built a professional network, and we're increasingly investing in building out the world's first economic graph. Microsoft, historically through software and increasingly through the cloud. But we're trying to accomplish the same thing. Satya is extremely purpose-driven. And Microsoft, under his watch, is becoming increasingly purpose-driven. It's very important to him. So we had alignment there. So you can check that box. And then we turned in that discussion to structure. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what he was going to say. Uh, was he going to ask me to move up to Redmond and for the organization to uh, relocate? And he said, uh, so I, I think in this case, it's really important that LinkedIn uh, continues to be independent. And he had me at independence. Yep. So we were talking about you know, what Facebook had done with uh, WhatsApp and Oculus and, of course, Instagram, what Google has been able to do with YouTube. And increasingly, you see these organizations at enormous scale uh, being able to acquire companies and uh, really preserve what has made those companies successful and allow those companies to continue to build off of that, but at the same time leveraging uh, the broader assets of the organization. And that is very much what Satya and I uh, were hoping to accomplish with this combination. So LinkedIn continues to pursue the same mission and vision. We continue to do so in a way that manifests our culture and values. We have the same leadership. We're doing the same work. But we have an opportunity now to leverage Microsoft's customer footprint of over a billion individuals that use their software and to leverage their extraordinary investment in advanced technology and to leverage all of that talent and to accelerate the realization of our mission and vision. And that's the hope. So we have one final question before we move on to, um, to a Q&A. Uh, you mentioned in a view with Oprah that, you're, um, that in your early 30s, you had a bit of a very fundamental change on your perspectives on life. Mm. And that led to a better you. 
I would say it's fair to say that most of us around here are uh, still in search of that better version of ourselves. So can you tell us a bit more about that transition and any pitfalls that we shouldn't or should watch out from? Dude, you want all Oprah on me. I mean, that's the full, <laughs> you, you want full Oprah, who did an, an amazing job, by the way, up uh, here. On this stage, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that interview. She was fantastic. <laughs> So uh, you may be referring to an interview I did with Oprah on Super Soul Sunday. Yep. And she was asking, how many of you watch Super Soul Sunday? Any Super, super Soulers? Will, you better get your hand up, man. <laughs> Will didn't even, thank you, Will. So uh, Oprah had done some research and done her homework for the interview. And she said uh, in reading uh, one uh, particular profile on me, that uh, I had been known in a uh, prior role before I got to LinkedIn uh, to be very intense, which I think would be putting it somewhat euphemistically. And uh, I, I am intense, and I was intense. And I, I, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, my management practices at the time where I was expecting people to do things the way I did them, and I would grow frustrated. And you know, it's not like yelling and throwing things frustrated, but frustrated nonetheless. Different management style than the one I have today. And she said, you know, what led to you managing compassionately and what's part of your practice? And I, I told her about some specific things that had occurred uh, within my, my role at the time. But at, at the end of the day, the, the biggest difference for me personally was meeting my wife. Okay. And my wife led to uh, a very different perspective for me. And she valued things that I hadn't placed as much value on historically. Uh, things like kindness and love and gratitude. And it changed everything for me. And I'm very, very fortunate to have met her. And, uh, you know, you hear all the time, I wouldn't be in this position if it weren't for, you know, so-and-so. But in my case, it's, it's absolutely the case. Thank you very much for that. Sure. We're going to open up the Q&A now. Um, There we go. Jeff, thanks for being here and for your candor today. My name's Holly May. I'm an alum from the collapse of 2016. I want to go back to where we started the dialogue. Um, and as you think about as an executive and as a uh, visible person in the Valley, how do you think about which topics to speak on and which not to? Uh, and in the current context, we've seen a lot of execs talk about the uh, executive orders, and yet this week starts Black History Month, and that hasn't gotten an equal amount of attention. Mm -hmm. How do you think about which, uh, which topics to show up on and which not to, and the consequences of those choices? Yeah, so, uh, you know, interestingly enough, we, we have a lot of activity planned within LinkedIn on Black History Month, and uh, it's being led by an amazing employee uh, resource group and our leadership there, and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, you ask uh, an excellent question, and you know my my first response would be there is no formula for this, there is no cookie cutter approach to this. Uh, it at times is a deeply personal decision. I think it's really important to know where you stand if you're going to be in a position of leadership, uh, to know what your company is trying to accomplish, to know how it wants to accomplish it to be very clear with people about those values and where you draw lines and where you're willing to compromise and where you're not. And when those lines get crossed, to do something about it, to speak up, to take action, and at the same time to recognize that your personal beliefs may be at odds with the personal beliefs of people that work within your organization. And that as long as people who disagree do so in a mutually respectful and compassionate and constructive way that is consistent with the way in which you want to go about your business, uh, consistent with your culture and consistent with your values, that every individual within an organization should feel as if they belong there. So that's the approach that I've taken, that we take as a leadership team. But it, it's going to be different depending on who you're talking to, depending on what they're trying to accomplish, depending on their own experiences.
Thank you so much for being here and sharing all the information with us. And I'm Akash. I'm an undergrad freshman. Uh, two real quick questions. The first one is, what kind of innovation do you think uh, is happening at LinkedIn? And what, what innovation are you concentrating more uh, on? And what advice do you give for undergrads who want to start tech companies? <laughs> <laughs> have a good LinkedIn profile. OK, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on the first, in terms of uh, the innovation taking place, uh, we are, last year, we completely overhauled our uh, mobile flagship application. Uh, we are in the process right now of uh, rolling out a new version of our desktop experience that's built on a new front end framework called Pemberley that's going to enable us to uh, iterate and innovate up to 10 times faster than what we could do historically. So we've got some very strong building blocks in place. Uh, we also have a very clear sense of the assets that we've been able to develop to date. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be investing in uh, more aggressively is uh, the application of artificial intelligence. Uh, both LinkedIn and Microsoft uh, have amazing talent along those lines, and uh, Microsoft has invested very heavily in this area. And we can bring that to bear on LinkedIn through things like uh, a bot experience that you could think of as your own personal assistant. So we could provide uh, a personal professional assistant to every member of LinkedIn, uh, whether that's calendar integration and providing you the inf information you need to be better prepared for the person you're about to meet, or ultimately uh, making sure you have access to the right information to complete a project. Uh, there's a whole host of things that we're very excited about to bring to bear there. Uh, we're going to continue to invest very aggressively in making our feed and the content within our feed uh, more relevant and more personally relevant. Uh, we've only begun to scratch the surface there. And what you're going to start to see this year are what we call interest feeds. So we can take packages of content by virtue of machine learning, social cues, and our editorial team. And we can curate these packages. Uh, so whether it's around the executive order or a major announcement by your company uh, or a, a shift in the economy, uh, you can not only see articles that were written by uh, you know, publishers that you're following or influencers that you're following, but what people in your network are, are saying and the information you need to know right now as a professional to make better decisions. So we've only begun to scratch the surface there, so stay tuned on that front. Uh, we are going to be starting to think about how we, and this is uh, somewhat consistent with the second part of your question, how we can uh, create... Uh, stronger marketplace dynamics with regard to opportunities that our membership is seeking. Not just jobs per se, although that's a huge priority for us, but say mentors and mentees, or people that want to get involved in philanthropic activities and the, the nonprofits who could use their skill sets or their resources. And for those seeking investment, if you're starting a company, uh, we've got a lot of people on LinkedIn who are very interested in investing. And those are just a few examples of what would be possible uh, with regard to those marketplace dynamics. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, we're going to start to experiment with that as well. And that's, you know, that's largely oriented around LinkedIn. Then there's a number of areas where we're very excited uh, to potentially uh, integrate assets with regard to Microsoft. So bringing LinkedIn, LinkedIn identity, uh, your network uh, into the office experience, uh, notifications within Windows. Um, we're excited about the opportunity. Um, you know, Microsoft Word is still uh, the primary resource people use to create resumes. And you can imagine the day where you're creating your resume and then a right rail appears, which asks you if you want to integrate that resume at the click of a button uh, into LinkedIn, refresh your profile, create a profile for the first time, and then we can recommend jobs for you within that context. So there's some exciting things we're doing along those lines as well. In terms of advice I would give to you uh, if you're interested in starting a company, I guess it, it wouldn't be dissimilar from the advice I would give anyone in the audience in terms of uh, how to optimize for their career path and how to achieve success. And that would be, first and foremost, to take the time to understand what it is you're ultimately trying to accomplish. And the more specific you can be, the more likely you will be to achieve it. And you're going to manifest that in ways explicit and implicit. And I don't mean this in some new agey, predeterministic way. I mean very practically. The clearer you are about what it is that you want to accomplish, uh, the more you can clearly communicate that to the people around you, 
the more doors are going to open up, the more you're going to attract the right kind of opportunities. Uh, so that's really important. And when it comes to defining what it is you ultimately want to accomplish, uh, try to optimize for two things, your passion and your skill, and not one at the exclusion of the other. So that would be first. Second would be to surround yourself with the best possible talent that you can. And when I was younger, I used to think that was all about hitching my wagon to the right train in terms of my boss or a mentor. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that as the world becomes uh, more networked, as we become more dependent on knowledge, and having the right knowledge at the right time to accomplish certain objectives, it's really about people. And so it's not just about who you work for, it's about who you work alongside of and who works for you. And making sure that you don't settle and you don't compromise in terms of where you set that bar on, on skill and talent and on fit with your own values. I think that's really important. Uh, personally, I like to work with people who dream big, who, can we curse here? Is that all right? Okay. Who get shit done. <laughs> and who know how to have fun. Not to be confused with constantly partying, because it's going to be difficult to get work done if you're constantly partying, but knowing how to have fun as a proxy for being of like minds culturally. So surround yourself with only the best talent. And the third would be to always be learning. The world is changing so fast right now. There's an acceleration. It's like logarithmic, the rate of innovation. And the days where you could study one thing and have a role or a, a job guaranteed for the rest of your life, I think those days are long gone. We have to constantly be learning, continuously learning. And if you have a natural inclination or passion for that, if you're naturally curious about the world around you, you will be that much better positioned to continue to learn over time. Well, we're not Oprah's uh, Soul Sundays, but we hope this was fun for you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you.